It's hard to think of many other games that are like Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne. Even when taking the entirety of Atlas's catalog into consideration, you'd be hard-pressed to find any other title that matches Nocturne in terms of tone, the type of story that's presented, and the themes that are conveyed, which is doubly impressive when you look at the sheer number of games in Atlas's Megami Tensei franchise. So, what exactly is Nocturne, and what does this game do to stand out from the crowd of other RPGs on the PlayStation 2? In order to answer those questions as well as evaluate Nocturne as its own game, I'm going to have to dig deep and explore the game mechanically and thematically. This is your spoiler warning now. I'm going to be talking about the game in depth, so that means spoilers are going to be discussed. If you're the kind of player that likes to go into games as blind as possible, I suggest you stop the video now and return once you finish the game. Nocturne starts off unlike most games with the literal annihilation of the entire world. You play as a high school student who was caught in the middle of this when you and your friends, Chiaki and Asamu, go to the hospital so you can check up on your teacher, Mr. Takao. There are rumors surrounding the medical center that you and your friends are visiting. People say that this place is used for occult activities. This is proven true once you stumble upon a man named Hikawa down in the basement of the hospital. He uses this strange terminal to summon a demon, but before he can kill you, he's stopped by your teacher. She threatens Hikawa that she'll no longer cooperate with him if he goes further, which causes him to stop. You meet with Miss Takao on top of the hospital where she explains that the world is going to end because of an event called the Conception. She explains that everyone who is currently inside of the hospital will survive and asks you to find her in the new world. Before we can even have a chance to register what's going on, the Conception begins, wiping out all life in a blink of the eye, transforming the world as we know it into the demon-infested Vortex world. At the same time, Lucifer gives you a bug-like creature called a Magatama. Magatama is the source of demonic power. And by ingesting it, the protagonist transforms into a half-human, half-demon known as the Demi-Fiend. Even though the world is currently in a state of chaos, that doesn't mean it'll be like this permanently. The Conception acts as a big reset button for the world. Once the universe has run its course, the Conception will occur so that the world can be reborn. Humans are able to conceive what are known as reasons. These reasons will shape what the new world will become and the ideals that will be followed. But this means that only one person has the power to change the world. Since the Demi-Fiend is half-demon, he's no longer able to create a reason of his own. But that doesn't mean he can't support the reason of another person. Nocturne's main plot is very simple on the surface, but most of its depth comes from the philosophical views of the other characters. The Vortex world is very cruel and unforgiving. It's a world where those with power are able to survive and live comfortably, but anyone who lacks the power to fight for their ideals are very expendable and don't deserve the chance at the inevitable reincarnation of the world. The characters' views and ideals are all influenced from their experience in the Vortex world. As much as I'd like to discuss what the characters' reasons are and the meaning behind them now, I need to talk about the gameplay side of Nocturne because it does a great job at supporting the game's main theme. Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne was the first game where Atlas really tried to innovate on their turn-based combat system. Persona 1 attempted to add more depth to the combat system by having battles take place on a grid, but this was a very mixed bag for me since at the end of the day, it didn't really change the overall foundation of the battle system because of how easy the encounters were. I could get away with just having the characters auto-attack. Nocturne is where Atlas really stepped up their game when it came to the combat mechanics and overall battle design. Nocturne was the pioneer of what is known as the press turn combat system. These icons in the top right of your screen represents how many turns in combat your party can make. The number of demons you have currently summoned will affect how many of these icons you get. Whenever you perform an action in battle, one of these icons will disappear. When you no longer have any press turns remaining, it'll be the enemy's turn. What gives Nocturne's combat a lot of depth is the way the press turn system can be used to give you an edge in battle. By landing critical hits or by exploiting enemy weaknesses, you only end up using half of a turn. This is indicated by the flashing turn icon in the top of the screen. By only using half a turn, you don't fully deplete the icon. So by landing multiple critical hits or only using magic that can hit weaknesses, you can effectively double the amount of moves you can make in one turn from 4 to 8. However, by missing an attack or using a move that the enemy nullifies, instead of using up one press turn, you instead use two. Even more deadly is that if the enemy absorbs or reflects an attack, every one of your press turns will be drained instantly. This is to encourage smart play. You have to consider every possibility when making a turn in combat. You need to know what the potential consequences are for picking the wrong move or becoming reckless. If you have a demon on the field that can't perform any move that will be optimal in that encounter, you could always just pass your turn. Exclusive to the player's party is the ability to pass anyone's turn in battle. Passing a turn will count as using a half turn, so you can still perform any other action with the half turn. You cannot pass a turn twice in a row without wasting the turn. 
Not too many people bring this up when discussing Nocturne, which I always found odd because it's such an important tool at your disposal. Just by doing something as simple as passing the turn on someone who isn't immediately useful in combat, you open up the door of possibly applying more buff spells and sneaking in emergency healing before you cycle back to your damage dealers. Though these mechanics may sound simple on paper, where Nocturne really shines is the way it pushes its battle system to the absolute limit. Nocturne has become rather infamous over the years due to its extremely high difficulty. And let me just say that I personally think that the challenge of Nocturne has been a little blown out of proportion, to the point where newcomers may be a little too intimidated to even check the game out. Don't get me wrong, Nocturne, even on its normal setting, is still a challenging game. You're gonna have to pay attention to the moves you select and respond to enemies appropriately, but I feel as though the most challenging part of Nocturne comes from learning how to play the game properly to begin with. There's no traditional tutorial area of Nocturne. The most you get are some hints on how to recruit demons to your party and the importance of having a full team. It's up to the player to learn the importance of certain skills and how to overcome any obstacle in your path. So there are two simple questions to ask. Does Nocturne give you the necessary tools to figure out the combat system on your own? And what does the game do in order to keep the battles challenging once you know what the game expects from you? The best way to answer the former question is by looking at the first major roadblock of the game, the infamous boss battle against the demon Matador. Matador acts as a skill check to make sure the player knows how to play the game properly. What makes Matador so infamous is his exclusive skill that maximizes his hit and evasion rate. This makes it almost impossible to land a hit on him normally. The game forces you to use buffs and debuffs to even the odds, teaching you the importance of those skills. But if you don't have those skills by the time you get to that fight, that doesn't mean you're out of luck. In the area just before the battle, you can buy another Magatama that can alter your resistances to nullify the force element, so you can get rid of Matador's press turns as well as just tank the damage. Not only that, you can recruit demons that you can then fuse into one that has the Sukukaja skill. So while Matador is a spike in difficulty, that doesn't mean the game doesn't give you the tools necessary to overcome the challenge. Sure, it might take a couple of tries, but that just means you need to adjust your strategy. Adapting and overcoming the odds is the key to succeeding in Nocturne. You can't hold on to the same demons forever because demons need far more experience than the Demi Fiend in order to level up. So to mitigate that, you can fuse away the old demons while transferring their skills over, or recruit new demons that can fulfill roles in your party that you may be lacking in. If the Demi Fiend has a weakness that the boss can exploit, switch out the Magatami you currently have equipped to not only cover that weakness, but to adjust your stats accordingly. So in short, yes, I think Nocturne gives you the tools necessary to figure out the combat on your own. Matador is a challenging boss battle, even on repeat playthroughs he can catch you off guard, but I believe that he's a necessary roadblock because this battle teaches you the importance of buffs and debuffs. But this leads into my second question, what does Nocturne do in order to keep battles challenging once you understand how the game wants you to play? Random encounters in Nocturne are relatively comfortable. Most enemies don't have a lot of health and have weaknesses that can be exploited but where the game truly shines in pushing you to your absolute limit are in the boss battles. I already mentioned Matador, but he's just the tip of the iceberg. In order to keep you from abusing the same strategies for every encounter, Nocturne's boss battles have tricks up their own sleeves that can keep you on your toes. Not every boss is created equal, however. While some may test you in unique ways, such as Beelzebub, whose AI performs certain actions depending on how many buffs or debuffs you have used, and Giri McCullough, who completely reflects physical attacks and is a check to make sure you have demons with powerful magic with you. There are a few that are very basic and offer next to no challenge. Most boss battles have a way to remove buffs and debuffs, some have access to their own stat boosters, and they'll abuse them as much as you do. However, another source of challenge comes from a boss exclusive move. Since the player has access to the ability to pass turns, a good chunk of mini bosses have access to their own skill called Beast Eye to even the odds. Beast Eye sacrifices one turn in order to gain back half turns, so essentially it's just a boost to how many actions the enemy can take in battle. I personally find this a bit of a lazy way to make a boss difficult, because rather than making the boss difficult from them having powerful moves or making the AI smarter, the difficulty comes from the fact that the enemies can just increase their turn counter out of nowhere. It just feels cheap whenever this is the entire gimmick of the fight. The best use for Beast Eye is when it's a punishment for trying to cheese the fight. When you fight the four riders, if you kill their minions before the main boss themselves, they'll counter with Beast Eye so they can not only resummon their minions, but also give themselves extra turns. It forces you to fight the boss in the way that it was designed to be. The worst example, and of course I have to bring it up, is Mott. Mott is fucking broken. I know, Mott is weak to electricity. 
But the problem is, that's really the only thing effective against him. He either voids or absorbs most other elements, and Mott is also resistant against physical attacks. But what makes Mott so infamous is his abuse of the Beast Eye skill. For some reason, Mott is scripted in a way that lets him use the skill Beast Eye multiple times per turn under the right condition, especially if you're playing on hard mode. Which means is that Mott can use Beast Eye to get an extra turn, only to use it right away again to get even more turns. What happens is that Mott ends up building up multiple buffs and will nuke your team and you're unable to do anything about it. The likelihood of this happening is low, but the fact that this is even something that can happen to begin with is a problem. But these underwhelming bosses are still fun due to the fantastic battle mechanics that Nocturne features. Nocturne has, what I believe, to be the greatest turn-based combat in any video game. When the bosses have interesting attacks and designs that let the player take advantage of all the mechanics at their disposal in interesting ways, that's when Nocturne is at its peak in terms of gameplay. Thankfully, there are plenty of bosses that do follow this design philosophy, but sadly, there are a few stinkers I have to mention because their quality is that much of a drop. One of Nocturne's most recognizable qualities is the world itself. Despite the fact that the world has been destroyed, there is ironically more life than ever before. Sure, humans may be near extinct, but when the world is now populated by demonic presence, they feel the need for interaction. Demons have a wide range of personalities that are expressed both in and out of battle. Demons can range from being more animalistic and instinct-driven, to demons that are far more passive and like to pass the time chilling at a bar. Demons also have their own hierarchy of power. At the end of the day, the Vortex world is ruled by those who have power, and those at the bottom of the food chain are either considered worthless, or in the case of the mannequins, a group that's meant to be preyed on. Mannequins, while humanoid in emotion and physical attributes, lack a soul to truly make them human. What makes the world far more interesting, however, is that the inhabitants have their own beliefs and philosophies. There are multiple factions in Nocturne that have their own bases you can visit in order to get a view on the demon's ideals. By the time the other humans begin to form their reason of creation, the demons will take a side with the ones that they believe in. The Vortex world is constantly evolving and it's never static. Events that happen in the story have ramifications on the world itself, which makes every action feel more important. Something I could praise Nocturne for is its fantastic atmosphere and world design. This is one of those accidental accomplishments made due to hardware and budget limitations, but the quiet and eerie Vortex world is oddly beautiful in the way it's presented. There's a feeling of hopelessness and dread while exploring the various landmarks in the destroyed state. Due to the lack of NPCs in the areas, you truly feel alone in this world, fighting just for your survival. Most of the dungeon themes are very ambient, which adds to the mood. But in terms of actual world design, Nocturne takes a very mature approach to its post-apocalyptic setting. Something that I notice is that the game is very strict on its use of disturbing imagery. The mature rating that this game earns is because of the complex themes and ideals that the game tackles, and not because the game is exploitive with its use of blood and gore. The only time blood is used in Nocturne is to enhance the mood, never for shock value. I've heard people say that the dungeon design in Nocturne is really difficult, but I've personally never agreed with that. For the most part, dungeons in Nocturne are pretty straightforward. Where the challenge really comes from are the encounters for the dungeon as well as the unique puzzles that you have to solve. The most difficult dungeon in the game from personal experience is the prison dungeon, since it involves you jumping between two realities in order to traverse the area. This mechanic is very integral to the way the dungeon is designed, and I find it very disorienting because when you're in the grayscale world, the prison is flipped upside down, so I can never remember if I was going the correct way or not. While on the other end of the spectrum, the Amala Labyrinth's challenge comes from how the dungeon is designed. I actually think that the entirety of the Amala Labyrinth is my favorite dungeon in the game because it features my favorite encounters and boss fights. Funnily enough, this content wasn't present in the original Japanese release of Nocturne. The version of the game we got is known as Nocturne Maniacs Edition. The Maniacs Edition adds extra demons, a new ending, and the Labyrinth of Amala, but none of these additions even compare to the little bit of cross-promotion that Atlas did with Capcom. You get the opportunity to fight and recruit the pizza-loving demon hunter himself, and yeah, Dante fucking rocks.
Look, I'm totally biased. I know Dante isn't a great character against bosses, but I do find him very useful against a lot of enemies, especially when grinding at the end game. But he's Dante from Devil May Cry, and he doesn't feel out of place at all in this game because he only makes appearances during the optional content. You bet your ass when Nocturne HD comes out that I'm buying the Dante DLC. Raido is cool and all, but come on, it's Dante. Alright, the gameplay and setting is good and all, but what about Nocturne's story and themes? After all, those two aspects are what I heavily focus on in my Atlas videos because those are what appeal to me most. I felt as though it was important to go over all the gameplay mechanics because unlike most Mega Ten games I've played, they actually help express the theme Nocturne has. But in order to explain why, I'm going to have to discuss the narrative of this game. If what you've seen so far has interested you, I highly recommend you play Nocturne now. It's a great game that's worth your time as long as you're able to adapt to what the game throws at you. Nocturne's plot for most of the runtime is very disconnected from itself. It's hard to justify the game with having an overarching narrative, but more so having multiple smaller stories going on all at once that all bleed together in the final act of the game. As I said earlier in the video, most of the story comes from the characters developing their philosophical views. So I feel as though talking about the characters individually and going over what their ideals are will be the best way to convey what the story is about. So first up on our list is going to be Isamu. The first impressions you get of Isamu is that he's a laid-back kid that sometimes acts a bit cocky, but after the conception occurs, his true colors are shown. Isamu isn't all that he hypes himself up as. He's actually much more timid and afraid of stepping out of his comfort zone. Isamu learns on his own that he can't rely on others in this dog-eat-dog -dog world, so he has to gather his own strength in order to survive. He ends up spending most of the game inside of the Amala network at that point, which is how he ends up developing his own reason. Isamu wishes for the world of Masubi to be born. Through the solitude that he himself experienced while inside the Amala network, he realized that the only person that matters in the world is yourself. People don't care about you, nor do you care about others. You will be the center of your own world with the reason of Masubi. What this means is that every being will be given their own pocket universe to exist in. Anything that they want changed can be done in the blink of an eye. No one will be able to bother you anymore since you control your own life. In order for Usamu, or anyone else for that matter, to create their reason, they must forge a contract with a demonic sponsor. Think of these sponsors as super powerful demons that can only be summoned when enough energy, also known as Magatsuhi, has been gathered. The goal of these sponsors are to give humans enough power to fight what is called the Kagetsuchi. Once the Kagetsuchi is defeated by someone who represents a reason, the new world will be born. Isamu's sponsor is a nameless god that has been forgotten throughout time, which is a feat only achievable through absolute solitude. He dubs his demonic sponsor Noah, and the two become one with Isamu taking the form of a red orb inside the demon. Isamu's reason, while seeming like a great choice for most people, comes with its own set of problems. The biggest consequence to giving everyone their own personal paradise would be that the human race would become stagnant, and unable to grow because there would be no one to challenge their ideals or mindset. If there's an obstacle in your life in the Kingdom of Masubi, you can just change it and not learn anything or grow as a person. People can be terrible, yes, but we can't rely on ourselves to fully change without any sort of outside influence. Of course, there's the obvious benefit with being able to do anything you can possibly imagine, but the question lies in if you think life will be fulfilling having that absolute isolation and always getting everything you wanted. This reason spawned less out of a selflessness to help others, but because Isamu was too cowardly in life and wanted to run away to his own utopia. If Isamu gained his reason by running away from the world and hiding, Chiaki gained hers by embracing the New World Order and discovering herself through combat. Her experience from the Vortex world leads her to believe that the only way life can have any sort of value is through power. The weak should all be wiped away from existence or serve the strong. Strength and beauty are one and the same in the kingdom of Yosuga. When Chiaki has the power to steal from the weak, she massacres the mannequins in Asakusa in order to steal their Magatsuhi. Her demonic sponsor fuses with Chiaki, turning herself into the Baal Avatar. The name Baal is used for the title Lord or Master, and it's also used as a substitute name for multiple deities. Chiaki wants to use her godly powers to shape the world in her image. Chiaki's reason boils down to being social Darwinism. The people with power are the ones that will be able to shape the world, while the rest will only exist as servants for the strong. I personally don't see any of the benefits of having this be the world order because it's a world of constant war of paranoia. 
There can only be one person at the top of this food chain, and because of the power hierarchy, there will always be someone trying to take that role for themselves. Physical strength being the only dictating factor of her worth is a hypocrisy on Chiaki's part, because she herself was a weakling for most of her life in the Vortex world. It wasn't until someone with power agreed with her that her reason even had a chance at existing. This is no doubt intentional, because seeing the flaws in someone's reason is supposed to make you question whether or not it's truly the best option for mankind. Yosuga functions as an extension to what the Vortex world currently is. It has the same basic rules and social structures as Chiaki's Yosuga, so we get to experience firsthand how terrible this could be for people. In my eyes, Yosuga would be the last reason I would support personally. The final reason we have access to is that of Hikawa. If you remember, Hikawa was the man that tried to kill the Demi-Fiend at the start of the game, and is the reason as to why the conception took place to begin with. Hikawa was a part of a group called the Cult of Gaia when he learned of the conception. At the start of the game, there were news reports going on that a riot at Yoyoki Park broke out over a communications tower being built. There were people who ended up dying in this riot, which caused panic in the city. But this wasn't the true story. Hikawa summoned an army of demons to massacre the Cult of Gaia in Yoyoki Park in order to get the attention of God. When God saw that the world had become unbalanced and impure, that's when he decided it was time for the conception. Hikawa entered the Vortex world with a reason already on his mind, so all he needed to do was gather the necessary amount of Magasuhi in order to summon his demonic sponsor. Hikawa's reason is to make the world of Shijima a reality. Hikawa's goal is to create a world of complete stillness, where all minds are one. The concept of individuality will cease to exist, and all war, pain, and segregation will be eradicated because all will be equal. The demonic sponsor for the world of Shijima is the god of the void, Ariman. Ariman is a deity in Zoroastrianism, and is the equivalent of the devil or Satan from Christianity. The world of Shijima is supposed to represent absolute equality. The idea is that individuality is eradicated and everyone exists in a vacuum of stillness and oneness. As I said earlier, this has the benefits of solving many world issues such as war, pain, racism, crime, all of that. But at the same time, this comes with the sacrifice of losing your identity and becoming nothing more than a cog in a machine. So the question comes down to how important individuality actually is. A world of perfect harmony and unity can only exist in the extreme case that Hikawa seeks. By reducing everything to nothing but a black void where minds just exist in complete stillness, we will achieve the eternal peace that he is talking about. When trying to think of how that world would look, it becomes terrifying. What's the point of even living to begin with if we can't enjoy the simple pleasures that life has? Whether that be the connections we have with the people around us, or the more materialistic needs. Hikawa's reason, much like Chiaki's, stems from hypocrisy. If only one person is able to change the world, Hikawa has contradicted his entire goal with Shijima as he himself has been given a privilege that others don't have. Maybe he sees this as a necessary evil to bring his ideal world to life, but it just proves the importance of being able to think for yourself and being able to question what's right and wrong. In a world without conflict, there would be no reason for mankind to even approve or take any actions to better themselves. There would be no difference between life and death in the world of Shijima. All three of these reasons have a few things that are in common with one another. As you may have noticed, all of these views are very flawed in one way or another. There's no objectively best philosophy, just one that you can agree or disagree with. But the problem I do legitimately have with Nocturne is the characterization of these three people, more so the lack thereof. If we take a step back from the story for a second and look at these characters as people, they're very one note and very underutilized. This is more so a problem with Chiaki and Asamu because they're supposed to be your friends from high school. There's implied history between you three, but none of that is ever really explored or developed. If you reject the character's reason, you're destined to battle them near the end of the game on your way up to the Kagatsuchi. They sure as hell aren't going to let you get in the way of their ideal world, and you need to take them down in order to proceed to the top. But there is such a missed opportunity here for some emotional weight. These are your old friends that you're fighting. It's supposed to make you think, where did it all go wrong? But we don't get any of that. There are some hints of something when Chiaki says that your friendship with her has to die in order for the world to be rebuilt, but it just doesn't hit the right notes. 
I believe that this was supposed to be intentional because in a game about presenting different ideologies and having the player pick which one they believe is the best for the world, there should be as little bias as possible in that choice. So keeping information about the characters away from the player does help with keeping your decisions in line with the reasons rather than the specific character. But I'm always gonna have preference, and I think that there could have been a way to have more fleshed out characters. It could really make you think about your actions if you side with a character when you personally disagree with the reason only to have them commit genocide in order to see their world through. It would be a consequence to staying loyal to your favorite character instead of picking what you truly believe in. Even though there are three different reasons you can side with, that doesn't mean you have to pick one of those reasons to begin with. There are a few endings you can get outside of siding with a reason, one of them relating to your teacher, Miss Takao. Miss Takao is fully able to harbor a reason of her own. She even goes as far as acquiring a demonic sponsor to do so. The problem that she faces, however, is that she lacks any sort of philosophy of her own that could lead to a reason developing. She wanted the previous world to become a better place, but is unsure of a reason as to how. She wants to create a better world, but she lacks a strong enough opinion as to what it should be. This is where her demonic sponsor, Aradia, comes into play. Aradia is a false god. What that means in the world of Nocturne is that she came from a world that has ceased to exist. There exists multiple universes all going through the cycle of creation and destruction. If a universe fails to be reborn during the conception, it will eventually die out. Since Aradia comes from one of these destroyed worlds, her powers are limited. The goal of a false god is to be reborn alongside the new world so they can get their powers back. So as of right now, Aradia lacks any sort of physical form and will occasionally take control of Mr. Cow's body in order to speak with the Demi-Fiend. Aradia is supposed to represent freedom. She questions and tests the Demi-Fiend's confidence about going against God's will if he were to reject all three of the reasons. Depending on how you answer these questions, you'll either be locked into the bad ending, or what is called the freedom ending. In the bad ending, the world will be stuck as the vortex world until the next conception, but because there are no more humans, it will be a constant cycle of destruction until the universe eventually dies out. In the freedom ending, you're able to accept Aradia's ideologies and following the path of freedom. When the Demi-Fiend is face to face with Kagatsuchi, he's warned that God has already tried to give the world freedom, but it did nothing but create chaos and that chaos eventually led down the path of the world's destruction. The Kagatsushi attempts to destroy the Demi-Fiend, but is ultimately defeated. Instead of the world being born anew, it ends up reverting to its previous state as if the conception never happened. In this ending, Lucifer warns the Demi-Fiend to keep his power and prepare, because by going against God's will, he's become an adversary to the Great Will himself. This ending is very self-explanatory. A world of freedom is a world where humans themselves dictate how they should live. The consequences being that there will always be terrible people in our world. Selfish and heartless people that just seem to enjoy taking advantage of others. But of course, there will always be the ones you can depend on that have impacted your own life. Changing things back to the status quo is only a temporary fix. The conception will still occur when the world has run its course. So in the end, changing things back to the way things were doesn't really resolve anything, does it? While I think what we have now is better than the options proposed by the other reasons, that doesn't change the fact that what we're doing by restoring the world is putting a band-aid on a leak, a temporary solution to a much bigger problem. Nocturne features a wide array of different endings you can obtain, but in a game that's all about moral ambiguity and player choice, there's the unfortunate fact that there's one ending in Nocturne that, objectively speaking, is the best ending of the game for a few reasons. I mentioned it briefly earlier, but this version of Nocturne that we got in North America was the Maniacs release. One of the additions was a brand new ending that has been dubbed the True Demon Ending. This ending is tied directly with the Labyrinth of Amala dungeon that was also added in this version of the game. The reason as to why I think that this ending is the best one is because it's the ending that offers the most amount of content. In order to get the true demon ending, you have to finish the Amala Labyrinth, which has three exclusive boss battles in it. One with the Lord of Flies Beelzebub, the Herald of God Metatron, and a rematch against Dante. In fact, to even recruit Dante as a party member, you have to reach the final Kalpa of this dungeon, so at that point, you may as well just finish this place off. But not only that, in order to gain access to more Kalpas of this dungeon, you need to collect Menorah from the Fiend race of demons. Other than Matador, these are all optional boss battles that offer a great challenge and are even better allies once you're able to fuse them. But wait, there's even more. When you finish the Labyrinth of Amela, you are locked into the true demon ending. You also get access to the skill called Pierce. Pierce is a passive skill that completely cuts through all physical resistances other than reflection, making it one of the best passive skills in the game. 
There's also the fact that by going through the Labyrinth of Amala, a lot of the questions involving Nocturne's narrative end up getting answered. You learn the backstory of Hikawa and Araria, there are ties to other mainline SMT games because of certain characters' fate, and you even learn about the existence of multiple universes and how the conception actually works. This is all natural exposition because every time you finish a Kalpa in the Amala Labyrinth, Lucifer and his assistant reward you with this information in an attempt to lure you into cooperation. It's as if the game itself is trying to tempt the player by dangling just enough to pique your curiosity. But the cherry on top of this is the final boss of the True Demon ending. Instead of the game ending after killing Kagatsuchi, you get an extra boss battle against Lucifer himself. Lucifer is without a doubt the hardest boss in the game. He possesses a crazy amount of HP, the most powerful spells and skills, and resists every element in the game including almighty damage. The only viable way to deal damage against Lucifer is by having demons with the skill Pierce. Demifiend will always have it, but if you grind enough levels to fuse Metatron, there are other ways for your demons to get Pierce. Alright, there's a lot of gameplay content packed into this route, but what exactly even is the true demon ending to begin with? By going down to the bottom of the Amala Labyrinth, the Demi Fiend trades away the last of his humanity to fully embrace his demonic side. Lucifer plans to destroy the Kagatsuchi so that he and his army of chaos can challenge God in a fight for true freedom. The trade-off, however, is that by destroying the Kagatsuchi without a reason, the entire universe as we know it will come to an end, with no possible way to rebuild it. But if you made it this far, you actually go through with it, and it's exactly how it sounds. The world becomes nothing but darkness, with a lone light far in the distance. If you defeat Lucifer in combat, you manage to prove your worth to him. The Demi Fiend leads Lucifer's army as their general in the final battle against God. And that's it. We don't get to see what happens next. It's left purposely ambiguous so that the player can form their own conclusion. This ending left me with a lot of different feelings racing through my head. It made me question if the actions I took were right, but after letting it rest for a bit and giving it some thought, I believe that this, at the end of the day, was the correct choice to make. In the current law of the universe, God is the one to decide the way we're supposed to live. If he sees that we've gone against his order, or have too much freedom, that's when the conception will occur. It's a constant cycle of destruction and creation. The only way to end that cycle is by killing off the concept of creation and taking a stand against this power, but this comes with great consequences. All of your friends, your loved ones, your entire world is sacrificed in order to come this far. This ending represents Nocturne's themes perfectly. Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne asks one simple question. How much are you willing to sacrifice in order to carry out what you believe is right? What is the price that comes with you staying true to those ideals, and how far are you willing to go with them? We get to see this in both the characters and the gameplay. The characters all give up parts of themselves in pursuit of their reasons. The most prominent example of this is the Demi Fiend himself. Throughout the game, you acquire new demonic powers to aid you in combat, recruit and fuse new demons to fight alongside you. As you gain more and more of these powers and rise through the rank of demons, you're slowly letting go of your humanity in order to gain that power. Only by fully embracing that demonic side, you're able to gain enough power to fight for what you believe in. In the case of the true demon ending, you have to go as far as ending your own universe in order to prove that we don't need someone to tell us how to live our lives, and that we should be able to forge our own path. That's why this ending, and the whole game for that matter, really speaks to me. Nocturne is a one-of-a-kind game. It's mechanically rich while at the same time, it hosts very thought-provoking ideologies. It's not a game without flaws. There's very much a reason as to why this is a very niche title at the end of the day. There isn't much in the way of story outside of debating which reason you support. But even then, I still feel as though the game shoots itself in the foot in that regard thanks to locking a lot of content behind one of the endings. I think the characters could have been fleshed out more in order to provide a lot more emotional impact in the later half of the game when you're forced to fight them. But those are only some flaws in an otherwise outstanding game that I think anyone can enjoy as long as you give it a chance. It isn't as accessible as Atlas's Persona titles, I think those games do a much better job with characters and narrative than Nocturne, and at the end of the day, I would still play something like Persona 4 before Nocturne at a personal preference. But that doesn't mean that Nocturne should be forgotten. In fact, in many aspects, it completely outshines the Persona games. So you bet your ass I'm gonna be picking up the HD remaster when that comes out. I might even do a live stream where I play through the game on hard mode. I've never done that before. At the end of the day, this game will always be considered a classic by me. There really is no other game like Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. I'd like to give a special thanks to all my lovely patrons whose names are on the screen now. 
I would also like to give a thank you to my good friend Nolan, also known as That Boy Aqua, for helping with the script of this video. He makes really good video essay content on more Western games, such as Assassin's Creed and the Batman Arkham games. You should really check him out if you're interested in those types of games, because he does a great job at going over both their successes and their failures. As I said in my last video, there will be at least one more NAM related video coming out in October. This one is a much smaller scaled video on Crash 4's mechanics and level design problems, but after that I'll be jumping right into the Persona 2 games to finish off the year. I'll have many updates on those projects at both my Twitter and my Discord, both of which are in the description of this video, so if you're interested please check them out. So once again, thank you all so much for watching and have a good one.